If you have a Bible, please open this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I will begin reading at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, and we'll continue on to chapter 2, verse 5. This is the word of the Lord. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And when I came to you, brothers, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. Father, we come into your presence tonight, a people in need of and desperately dependent upon your truth. We are pressed and we are afflicted in so many ways by the world around us. This world hates you and it hates your word. But despite this, may you work your power through your gospel in us this night and speak to us the words that you want us to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Lord willing, I will graduate from Westminster Seminary at the end of this week. And after being with you next Sunday, we will be leaving. We will be returning to Wyoming for a brief while and then heading to Anchorage for our internship. So coming to the end of such a season in life brings a lot of reflection. This time in seminary, this time of study of the word all the various people that I've come across in this time and the things I've experienced. You wouldn't think that this would happen, but in seminary, there are people who don't make it through. They come to seminary, they think that uh, they've got it together, they think that their faith is strong and it's established, and that they're well on their way to a life of ministry or scholarship or whatever they're on their way to, and then their faith fails. They end up leaving the faith. They walk away from Christianity, or they go off into some other false church. I've seen it happen even in my time here in these last few years. Even a lot of the scholarship that we have to read, because part of Preparing for the ministry is being able to deal with views that may be in opposition to Christianity or in opposition to the truth. A lot of the things we have to read, it's not interested in the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And some guys will come in and they'll start to read this stuff and it sweeps them away. They get caught up in it and they're on their way to Rome or to Constantinople or to some other place where the truth of the gospel can no longer be found. 
This isn't just a seminary issue or a school issue, a college issue, anything of the sort. Lately we've been seeing this, it's kind of become this popular thing that people are doing, this idea of deconversion or deconstruction of one's Christian faith. We've seen in recent months and years a lot of once prominent Christian figures who more or less have decided and made very publicly their announcement that they are no longer Christian. Just in recent days, a member of the band DC Talk, which if you were like me, a Christian growing up in the 90s, was a pretty big deal, he just announced that he is an ex-evangelical and he has deconstructed and has progressed into believing some universal Christ. Now, just guessing, this is not the Christ that in John 14 tells us that no one comes to the Father but through him. But like I said, this is a, becoming a popular thing. A lot of people are doing it. We hear probably every few days about a new case of somebody who has done such a thing, this deconversion or deconstruction. And the world applauds this. Because the world sees Christianity as some relic of a bygone age that it has moved beyond. Christianity is too exclusive. It's too narrow-minded. It's too anti-intellectual to really work in this day and age. The evangelical church of recent decades has done a lot of trying to parrot the culture and the world around it, even in Reformed churches, we can feel that pressure. Well, we need these big spectacles in our worship. We need the bands with these professional-grade musicians, and we need lights and smoke machines. We need to make this situation that's indecipherable from a concert. We need shorter sermons that might have a little scripture sprinkled in, but they're really just good advice for how to live life in this world. We don't want to get too deep into doctrine because it's divisive. We want the world to think that we're smart and that we're cool, so it will come and check out what we have to offer. Have you seen this? Have you felt this? Have you experienced this? Have you heard about it? Many churches, many ministries go this route of trying to look like the world, only to be surprised when... For instance, these celebrity figures it might produce or its members or even especially its children end up looking like and leaving for the world. When we're parroting the world, the world is always going to do it better. And so in a time such as this, we as Christians need to be reminded of who we are and where we came from and what we are here for. And we need to be reminded of what we have and what we need. So tonight, we come to these opening chapters of 1 Corinthians. Now, my fellow intern Peter Bell, he exhorted on the text right before this, a couple of months back. Um, and in that text, we see the Apostle Paul writing to this young, troubled, divided church in Corinth, beginning to do this very thing. Remind them of who they are, where they came from, and what they are supposed to do. Now, things in Corinth, when Paul is writing to them, are bad. Really bad. This church has broken into factions around their favorite teachers. Some want to follow Paul. Some want to follow Apollos. And some want to be the, you know, extra good ones and say, well, I follow Christ. I can kind of feel this. I can, I can relate to this a little because this happens a lot in seminary. Guys pick their niche teachers and movements and follow after them. And we spend a lot of time disputing, arguing about these things. But in Corinth, this is to reach the point where it's threatening to split the church apart. And that's not the only problem. There's great sin in the church. Later on, Paul, in this book, he unpacks some rather difficult issues. There's some grievous sexual immorality, the kind that even the world bristles at. 
There's lawsuits going on between believers, bringing public scandal onto the name of the Lord. There's abuse of the Lord's Supper. You have people crowding the table and grabbing all the food so nobody else can have any. There's total chaos going on in the church's worship. This church badly needs some reminders of who they are and what they're here for. And that is what Paul gives them in these opening chapters. So I want to look at this passage I've read tonight, these reminders from Paul, in three points. First, we are going to look at a peculiar choice. That is chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Second, a powerful Christ. That's verses 30 and 31. And then third and finally, proclaimed with certainty. So that is chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Peculiar choice, a powerful Christ proclaimed with certainty. And what we will see tonight is that the gospel is sufficiently powerful to do what it is purposed to accomplish. So first we will look at a peculiar choice. So in the previous passage, verses 18 through 25, Paul has laid out how the gospel is foolishness to the world. Yet, it is the very power of God for salvation. This is God's plan and God's design. God has chosen to work in this world through what most would consider to be foolish. God the Son becoming a lowly servant who suffers and dies and is raised from the dead. Greeks and Jews alike reject it for its foolishness. It's not smart enough. It doesn't line up with our expectations for what is wise, what is intelligent, what is worthy of philosophical reflection. And it's not powerful enough. It doesn't overthrow Rome. It doesn't get them out of here. It doesn't make a this-world kingdom with a this-world king sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem or anything of that sort. So because of this gospel's apparent lack of wisdom or power, many reject it. And yet, for those God has called, this gospel is nothing less than the very wisdom and power of God. And God expressing his wisdom and power through something this world finds so foolish carries on into the kind of people that he chooses, which is what Paul brings out in verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. There are many times we see throughout Scripture where God chooses what the world would find to be lesser over something that the world would see to be greater. Think back to the Old Testament. God chose the younger, less manly Jacob over the older, stronger brother, the hunter, Esau, to carry on his covenant promises. God chose David, the youngest of the sons of Jesse, to be his great king. In the New Testament, Jesus chose a rather interesting band of disciples, fishermen, tax collectors, not the most glamorous bunch of people. Now, this is not to say that Jesus only works through, you know, the unpopular, rejected people, the the lower class or the uneducated. I mean, Jesus did count among his followers, Some of the leaders and the wealthy, so for instance, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, both important figures in the gospel story. Paul himself was something of a scholar. He had a proper Jewish legal education, and he was a Roman citizen. But the point here is that there's no particular standard of wisdom or power or other sets of qualifications that God is looking for in those he calls to be his people. This isn't a country club where you have to have a certain income level or job description to get in. Now, someone Paul was writing to might read this and think, thanks, Paul, for reminding me that I am not wise or powerful or of noble birth. But there is a reason he does this. 
It's in the first thing he says. Consider your calling. Basically, think about why you are here. What brought you here? It's not the powerful rhetorical and intellectual appeal of the gospel. As previously discussed, it is weak and it is foolish on those terms. It's not because you're a wise or strong or noble person, because you very well may not be. And even if you are, you are surrounded by people in the church who are not. Paul is reminding the church in Corinth, and it is also a reminder to us that the reason we are here, the only reason we are here, is because of God's calling. Apart from it, we would not believe in this gospel. We only believe it because it is the power of God, because God has chosen us to believe it, and by his Holy Spirit, he has granted us faith and new life. If you're a Christian, it is by no virtue or power or merit of yours. It is by God's sovereign choice, by grace alone. This is what we see next in these next few verses. Verses 27 through 29, we see that God has chosen three kinds, the foolish, the weak, and the low. Why has he done this? To shame the wise and the strong and to bring in things that are not. God is not doing a work of redemption in this world that is meant to just get along and go along with this world. God is remaking this world. The gospel brings in a new world order. You might remember a very well-known passage from the Sermon on the Mount, the Matthew chapter 5, these Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now you look at all of these things that Christ calls blessed. These are attributes and behaviors that in our human nature, we're not exactly inclined to want to sign up for. Do you want to be poor in spirit? Just thinking naturally, apart from what you know about the word. No, you probably wouldn't really want to be that. Do you want to mourn? No, that means you've experienced some kind of loss or tragedy. Do you want to be meek? No, naturally, we want to be strong. Do you want to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Well, no, we don't want that because we tend to, in our fallen nature, think that we're pretty righteous already. Do we want to be merciful? No, we want eye for an eye. We want people to get what they deserve. Unless, of course, we're the ones who did the wrong. Do we want to be pure in heart? I mean, we're usually not. Are we peacemakers by nature? No, that's difficult. Do we want to be persecuted? Of course not. But this is the kind of order, the kind of kingdom that God, through Christ, is bringing in by the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit. It is an overturning of this present world, of this present age. But why? Why? Why this order that seems so unnatural and subversive? We get the answer in verse 29. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God is working things out in this age and in his church for his glory, not for ours. He is working in this world 
and drawing a people to himself in such a way that we can't brag about it. We can't take credit for it. We can't claim the victory because this is not the way that if we were calling the shots, we would want to do it. But why? What is this for? We have God drawing in this people that by worldly standards doesn't really make sense with a message that by worldly standards doesn't really make sense. So what's the purpose? Well, this leads us to our second point. Having looked at the peculiar choice, we now look at our powerful Christ. Look at the beginning of verse 30. And because of him, that is God, you are in Christ Jesus. The purpose of this undertaking, this particular people called by a peculiar gospel, is to unite them to Christ. How are we united to Christ? What well, is a deep personal, inseparable union. It is the union that a head shares with its body. Later on in this book, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that's the image that Paul uses to describe the church's union to Christ. The work of the gospel is to unite us to Christ, to make us his body, to make us his people. Now with that union comes blessings and benefits, as we see in the rest of this verse. Four of those benefits. Wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We've already talked here a good bit about wisdom. The world's wisdom rejects God and the things of Christ. True wisdom is the right knowledge of God. True wisdom is is knowledge and belief in this gospel. Christ has become for us this wisdom. By our union to him, we can believe what we ought to believe concerning him, what is true concerning Christ. And then these remaining benefits listed here help to unpack what Christ has become for us. So we see in our union with Christ, Christ becomes our righteousness. That this happens shows us that apart from him, there was something wrong, something inadequate about our own righteousness. We all have a natural inclination to self-justification and self-righteousness. We want to think that we're pretty good people. That's part of why people find the gospel so offensive and foolish, because it requires them to believe that they are sinners, that they are unrighteous. People want to believe they're pretty good and that at the end of everything, God will accept their pretty goodness. Or as long as, maybe it's like the balancing scales. Some people think of it this way, that if we're more bad than good, then at the end, God will accept us. The gospel doesn't allow for this. In the gospel, man was created good, without sin, able to keep the law. But man has fallen into sin. We share the guilt of Adam's first sin, and we have the guilt of all of the sins that we have committed against God's holy law. And there is nothing we can do on our own to undo that or make up for that. And for this, we deserve the wrath of God and eternal punishment in hell. We do not have righteousness of our own. We are stained by sin. We need someone else's righteousness. As reformers would call it, an alien righteousness to be credited to us. And in Christ, we receive his very righteousness. The righteousness of the sinless God-man who kept the law perfectly on our behalf and suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sin. This righteousness is what we receive in our justification. But as verse 30 also tells us, we receive sanctification. We are made holy. We are conformed into the image of Christ. 
Through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we strive with a free conscience against sin and the devil in this life, as our catechism says. We don't do this out of obligation to try to save ourselves, because we are saved. We are in Christ, and so in thankfulness and gratitude, we strive to do what is pleasing to him. And finally, we see in verse 30, we have redemption. We have been purchased. We belong. We have been transferred to the ownership of Christ. Our sins are forgiven, and we have eternal life and salvation. And all of these things work together, for this is God's plan for our redemption. And all of these benefits come to us as a free gift of grace in Christ. We are chosen in the Father, and this work is applied to us by the Holy Spirit. It's not of us. We didn't do this. We didn't earn this. We wouldn't even believe this if God didn't grant us the ability to believe. So boasting in anything about us or anything we contributed to this is out of the question. And Paul gets this. And so in verse 31, he references the Old Testament. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 is where he's looking there to drive this home. But if we are to boast in anything, it's in God and the great things he has done for us and in us and through us. We boast in this saving power of Christ that we have experienced more wise and more powerful than anything else we could conceive or imagine. So what do we do with this knowledge, this knowledge of where we have come from, which is that peculiar choice of us to be God's people, and the purpose for that choice, which is our union to this powerful Christ? The question rises, so what? Well, this brings us to our third and final point, proclaimed with certainty. So Paul, at the opening of chapter 2, describes how he came to the Corinthians. Paul and his associates started this church. They planted this church. You can see the story of that in Acts chapter 18. In Acts 18, we see that Paul was there for a while. He was there for 18 months. And this account in Acts describes a tumultuous time. So when Paul gets there, he first goes to the Jewish synagogue to preach, as he often did, and there he was rejected. And so he goes to the Gentiles. He sets up shop in a house right next door to the synagogue, the Jewish house of meeting. And there many come to faith in Christ and are baptized. And then in Acts 18.9, Paul has a vision from the Lord. Acts 18.9 says, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. So God had a purpose in bringing Paul to Corinth to preach this gospel, to draw in the people that the Father had called, that he had chosen. The work was difficult. Paul was later brought up on trial, brought up on charges, although he was freed. It could be easy to see why Paul, in the face of such difficulty, might begin to doubt and be afraid. And so thus, God gave him this vision to reassure him. Well, in, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we see Paul's own accounts of his coming to Corinth. In verse 1, he says he did not come with lofty speech or wisdom. Now, it's not that Paul never did anything like that. In fact, just the chapter before in Acts, in Acts 17, he went to Mars Hill in Athens, the city of great philosophers and philosophies. And he presented the gospel there in such a way to try to help these philosophers make sense of it. It did have some effect. A few there did believe but most of the people there mocked and rejected Paul. They couldn't get over this idea of resurrection from the dead. So after 
that episode, what does Paul do? He comes to Corinth, and we see in verse 2 his approach. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul came to Corinth with the gospel. That was it. He didn't try to make it smart or cool or philosophical. He just gave it to them straight. And God encouraged him, blessed his efforts, and so there was founded this church to whom Paul was writing. But Paul gives more details in verses 3 and 4. He was there in weakness and fear and trembling. The gospel faced resistance in Corinth. The Jews wanted it out of the city, and they tried to get Paul in trouble with the law to do it. We don't get much more detail than that, but weakness, fear, and trembling are some things I think we can at least understand and relate to a little bit, knowing the difficulties of this life and hostility to the gospel in it. But Paul continues, My speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul was practicing and proclaiming a faith not rooted in anything that this world has to offer, but single-minded devotion to Christ and his gospel, to Christ crucified and the power that the gospel brings to save us from our sins and unite us to Christ as a people for his name. We face in our present day a lot of hostility to the power of this gospel of grace. This idea that Christ gives to us fallen sinners salvation and life. The world wants something else. The world does not want confrontation in its sin, but validation. Meanwhile, it wants to look to the sins of others and pronounce condemnation. The destruction of those who do not so validate. Many others are some of the same in this world demand a political and societal transformation. And see the gospel that is oriented towards a life after this one as a cop-out or a refuge in which to hide things like bigotry, injustice, racism, sexism, and the like. Remaining faithful to and proclaiming this gospel in this world is going to cost us. I can't sugarcoat those details for you. As a pastor friend once told me, it may cost us friends. It may cost us jobs. And we may have to learn to be okay with that. But we can do this as Paul did by having what Paul describes in the last verse of our passage tonight. We have a faith not resting in the power and wisdom of man, but in God. We have seen tonight Paul's case that the gospel, only the gospel, is sufficiently powerful to do what God purposes it to do. We have seen this peculiar choice of a seemingly weak and unwise people to be God's people. We have seen a powerful Christ that God unites us to by his spirit and thus gives us all the blessings of our salvation. And finally, we have seen how this Christ was and is and can be proclaimed with confidence as Paul did in Corinth and as the world needs now, even as it bristles and rejects. For Paul in Corinth, the gospel was all he had, and it was all he needed. And for those of us who are in Christ here tonight, the gospel is all we have. It is the only thing that will outlast the things of this world, its sins, its fads, its hatred, its rejection. And so we cling to Christ despite the rejection, because only there will we find salvation of our souls. 
We can say to Christ what Peter did in John 6, 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The world hates these words of eternal life, but it is perishing for lack of them. And the world can never give us anything that will compare. Yet while this gospel is all we have, it is all we need. God will use it to bring his purposes to pass. And we can cling to it with confidence and we can share it with confidence, knowing that it is by God's power that it changes hearts and minds and lives. Our confidence and faith are not in ourselves, but in the God who is able to do these things. Perhaps you're here tonight and you hear this gospel and you scoff at its foolishness. Friend, apart from Christ, you will perish. Whatever you are chasing after in this world will not save you. You will die, this world will end, and nothing else you are holding to will save you on that day. And yet in Christ you are offered forgiveness of sins, righteousness, salvation, and everlasting life. Repent of your sins and trust in Christ. But for all of us here tonight, let us be confident in this gospel. This gospel you have and this gospel that you proclaim wherever you go to whomever will do exactly what God purposes it to do. And you can be certain and confident in that. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word you have given us through your apostle and the confidence it inspires. We pray that we would cling to this message of Christ crucified with all we are because it is all we have and all we need. We pray that we would be bold to take it to others so that they too might be numbered among your people. Bless us and strengthen us as we go forth to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.